my name is Steve Cavanaugh with the Art of Jamming Music Instruction Techniques, an educational series. Thanks for joining us. We're going to be talking about the art of jamming, how to play and improvise with a group of musicians in the style of Fish, The Grateful Dead, Almond Brothers, etc. I'm here with you today because music is my passion, especially improvised music. Here's what we're going to learn with this method. We're going to improve the mechanics of group playing, how you play with other musicians. We're going to learn how to add improvisational scenarios to your music. We're going to learn exercises that are related to that improvisation, special techniques that will allow you to listen and react in real time to enable ensemble improvisation. We're going to learn some seed ideas that's going to help you to get started. And we're going to learn some troubleshooting as far as maintaining your group cohesion. We're going to talk a lot about tension dynamics and we're going to have some awesome uh, jamming technique demonstrations with the band for you. As far as the course structure, we're going to first talk about some technical aspects, then we're going to talk about mental aspects, what goes on with your mind when you're, when you're jamming, and then we're going to talk about teamwork. Okay, so let's get into what is jamming. The art of jamming. Let's define the word jamming. When I talk about jamming, I'm talking about collective improvisation. That's improvising with using the whole group, not just one person improvising or soloing, but the entire group playing off of one another. The group does this dynamically through building tension and release. Through a series of peaks and valleys, the jam progresses. This is kind of like improvisation without any boundaries. Typically in improvisation there's a certain set of changes that is adhered to throughout the entire musical event. With jamming, we're kind of stripping away the boundaries. There's no set format. There are no set changes. Okay, we're breaking down the rules and the barriers. And we're really allowing the music to take off on, on its own so that the music is a product that is greater than the sum of its parts. A very important element to keep in mind here is the element of risk. You want to take a big risk when you're getting into jamming and to really try something new and to get out of your comfort zone. Okay, So commit to challenging yourself right now to take risks and to overcome your fears. Just as important as anything else when you're jamming is listening. We're going to talk about how listening is its own instrument. So just as proficient as you are on the guitar or any other instrument that you might happen to play, think about jamming as a conversation. I say something and then you say something as a response and then I say something as a response to that. As a result, the conversation progresses over a period of time. Another way to think about uh, jamming is going to be taking a musical ride together. Uh, let's, think, uh, let's think about taking a road trip as an analogy. So you're in the car with some friends and you're driving through the mountains, let's say. And one person is driving, but the others are looking out the other windows in the car and somebody looks over and says, oh, look at that, you know, and then everybody takes a look and sees that and then looks over here and sees that. And the whole time you're in the same vehicle, but you're doing this thing where you're going up and down and experiencing the peaks and valleys of the driving. Another good example, uh, hacky sack of course is a sport uh, where you play with a little ball, you get in a group, 
and the ball, the goal of, of the sport is to keep the ball from hitting the ground. Now, somebody can get the hacky sack and they can solo with it and then they pass it on to the next person or across the group. The idea is to keep it going um, without the ball hitting the ground. I would agree, yeah. yeah. I, I view improvising and uh, I mean, in terms of a jazz construct, you know, like you have an idea in your head to contribute to the piece, you know, and this is more of a solo ex escapade, you know, of your, you know, expression. I consider jamming to be more of a group activity in a way, you know, just you're communicating with everyone else on making a, a whole idea versus a singular idea. <laughs> Thank you.
let's get into elements of a typical jam. At the core of this is going to be more or less a musical well that all the members of the jam are contributing to. So think about it as you're putting input as an individual musician and as all the other musicians in the group are putting input into this well. And then through the bottom of the well comes the output and you're reacting in real time to that output and then putting in new input into the top and it becomes a feedback loop that continually goes. At the core of the jamming method is what I call parameters and you're being aware of these parameters. Parameters are essentially anything and everything that will affect your playing. These are things that are both conscious and subconscious, things that you realize, things that you are aware of and things that you are not aware of. Parameters can be anything from the baggage that you bring into the jam session, such as your mood uh, or your attitude, your life experience or just events that have happened in your life that day leading up to the jam session. Uh, parameters can include the environment, so think about the room that you're playing in, the lighting, the musicians that you're playing with, the equipment that you're using, or the audience or lack thereof. And of course there are the musical components. There's the note selection, the key, uh, the volume, uh, the attack or intensity that you bring to the music, um, the scale that you're in, uh, the mode, the arpeggio you're playing, uh, the degree to which you're listening. These are all examples of parameters. Okay, so in this example you can see the input is coming in on the left hand side and it's going through these parameters as they constantly shift r at random and then on the right hand side the output or the result is coming out and it is recycled back through as new input as time is always flowing along. Okay, let's talk about music theory principles and how they relate. First thing we're going to talk about is composition versus jamming. I want you to start to think about collective improvisation as a spontaneous composition. In order to get into this we need to kind of break down what exactly is the compositional process? It's pretty simple if you're going to write a song, right? You kind of come up with an idea, maybe a melody or some chords, you sit down with your guitar and you start to kind of write them out and figure it out. As you go along, you're going to expand and ultimately revise that idea into something that in your mind is perfect and a nice concrete idea. So how does this all apply to jamming? Well, how about when you're playing an improvised solo? you're kind of coming up with an idea right away and then you're immediately trying to expand and revise it in between your mind and then at the point to where it gets to the end of your fingers. It's very fast. So that brings us to making a point on what is the major difference. It's time. Okay, That can be a very good thing and a very bad thing. The reason that it's bad is because musicians tend to strive for perfection. But it's a good thing in that mistakes will happen but that's all right. If you can embrace that, you'll ultimately realize that that is what distinguishes your style from others. You cannot control time. Okay, it's going to pass with or without you. So what does that kind of mean ultimately to an improviser? Uh, you don't want to try to direct or conduct anything now or in the future. You just have to kind of learn to be patient. Um, the other thing is don't beat yourself up over the mistakes. Again, they're natural. It's bound to happen, okay? And then you mentally just want to try to stay in the moment as much as possible. When you hit a good groove and you're really jamming and, and all, all firing on all cylinders, you don't want to start thinking about what you might do in the future or what just happened. You kind of want to stay right in the middle of the two. So mentally stay in the moment as much as you can.
incorporating music theory principles into jamming. Let's talk about voice leading. Uh, by definition, two or more voices can move in only four basic types of motion. The first is parallel, where the voices stay the same interval apart. The second one is similar motion, where voices move in the same direction, but by different intervals. The third is contrary motion, where voices go in opposite directions. And the fourth is oblique motion, where one voice moves while the other voice stays the same. So the question then again becomes, how can we incorporate this into jamming? Well, how about if you listen to what somebody else is playing in the group and execute a figure that specifically exploits one of these motions? All right, let's talk about tension and release. Basically, there are three types of tension that you can experience and play with when you are jamming. The first is rhythmic tension. Rhythmic tension is built by straying from the time or the feel. Again, this can be intentional or unintentional. This is built up and then released by landing on the one together as a group. Harmonic tension is built by creating harmonic dissonance, specifically getting away from the home chord or the home modal center. This can be playing notes that are outside of the home chord or the home set of chords that you're playing with. You can balance ideas off of one another and get farther and farther away from that home chord uh, spe specifically by playing chromatically or something like that and then this tension is ultimately released by landing back on that home chord together as a group. The third type of tension is emotional tension. This one is not really a whole lot of science to it. Uh, it's more art uh, and really what we're doing here is as musicians in the group we're building collectively until you're really feeling it together. You know you're, you're hitting the groove and it's just making you want to dance. This is released by being aware of where the other two types of tension are and their status at any given point in time. These three types of tension can occur as separate instances on their own, but when they occur together as a group, that's when the magic happens.
mental aspects of jamming, specifically conscious versus subconscious control. The goal here is to find balance between the two. When I talk about conscious control, I'm talking about uh, your music theory knowledge, stuff that you know, your bag of tricks, your go-to licks. We're going to use those for you to fall back on. Okay. Try not to consciously uh, direct the jam or control it or control other members that are playing with you. Um, think more in terms of creating something that is organic in nature. Subconscious control is more of an instinctive type of playing. Um, you're not really so much in control, but it's more relying on your instincts that you've developed. Uh, instinctively knowing and reacting to what you're hearing uh, coming from the other players in the group. Um, in, happening, of course, in real time. Of course, then also there's the muscle memory of the habits that you've developed over many years of playing that you can kind of rely on without thinking about. Uh, unique tendencies, uh, such as scale patterns or licks or riffs or something along those lines that you're very familiar with and don't have to think one bit about. All right, so don't be afraid to take any risks, you know. Uh, get out there, get out of your comfort zone, jump right into the music, and just, just play what you want and experiment. That's the only way you're really going to learn anything through any of this, and ultimately the only way you're going to get better is to practice with taking those risks and experimenting with the music. So get away from the stuff that you're familiar with, and get out there and just don't be afraid to play a wrong note or to play something that's unfamiliar. You gotta keep in mind, oftentimes great discoveries come from making these mistakes, right? I I've created a lot of music in my life that have come from making mistakes that has been some of the best music that I've ever made. So don't rob yourself of the possibility. Just, you know, don't be afraid to take that risk. Constantly ask yourself questions. For example, how could you mix or rearrange a given set of parameters? How can you change something? How can you make something better? How can you revise an idea that you think is good, but now can be much better because you're applying some different parameters that are within your control to that line that you're playing? creative exercises that you can use to expand on the jamming. One of the things I like to do is try to create images with the music that I play. Um, a good way to do this is to think about the music that you're playing and think about what does it remind you of? Um, you know, what image does it create in your mind? And then once you have that image in your mind, kind of try to play around with it a little bit and try to produce the images or scenario that's unfolding in your mind musically. Another cool thing to do is to try to mentally paint or draw the music in your mind. Um, this can be a good exercise in parameter awareness, specifically what brush would you use? Would it be a large thick one or a small tiny one? What colors would you use based on what type of paint that you have? Here's some more creative exercises you can do. The no personification or tangibility. Of course, personify means to give a human-like quality to an inanimate object. So when we're talking about notes, for example, how about sharp and pointy notes as compared to dull and flat notes? A sharp and pointy note could be a quick and loud note, whereas a dull and flat note might be soft and a longer type of note. Another cool thing to do is to imagine the music as being heard through someone else's ears. This forces you to kind of step outside of your own head to try to gain objectivity and a different perception of the music. So, for example, what would it sound like to the drummer? You know, what is he hearing in this same music that we're creating together?
Listening is probably the most important thing besides playing your instrument that you can do. I often tell people that listening is as important, if not more important, than learning your own instrument. You have to learn to listen the same way, and you have to practice listening the same way that you practice your instrument. So the easiest way to kind of learn how to listen to your other band members is to just focus on one instrument first. Let's say the drums, for example. And then what you do is you kind of try to create a figure that is kind of repeating what they're playing but complementing and nesting inside of that uh, at the same time. And what you're ultimately going to want to do is layer repeating patterns. Each band member should be playing a complementary repeating pattern that layers inside of the other patterns being played. So you're ultimately you're kind of listening for holes in the music that will complement one another. Always remember that music is a conversation. There's back and forth, give and take. You don't talk over top of one another. You listen to what the other person has to say and then respond accordingly. Okay, so responding. The idea is to come up with and quickly create and execute a desired response. Also, what you can do is kind of help to catch others when they fall. So if somebody makes a mistake, you can kind of go along with them. And let's say they play out of the tonal center a little bit. You kind of follow them with chords or whatever that's complementary to that. So you're kind of altering your response according to uh, what you're getting as far as the input from the group. Another thing that you can do when you're responding is catching others when they fall and helping them to cover mistakes. So if somebody else in the group plays a note that's out of the tonal center, you can kind of help playing something that's complementary going outside of that tonal center as well. And it sounds like the music was supposed to go there on purpose. The best way to get started is for one instrument to play a simple repeating pattern. Once that instrument is doing that, everybody else in the group is listening, and then the next designated person starts to play a simple repeating pattern that complements the first one. You go around until all the other instruments are layered one at a time in a similar fashion until everybody is playing.
creativity becomes stale because beginning musicians or beginning improvisers will tend to go to their go-to licks and things that they're familiar and comfortable with and it's hard for uh, beginning improvisers to kind of get out of their box so to speak they're using their familiar musical language so here's a way that I've created to get around this and it's what I call the 15 minute minimum jam exercise what you do is you get a clock and you put it up so everybody in the room can see it and there's one rule and that is no one stops playing until 15 minutes have passed. Chances are good you're going to create some pretty ugly music in that 15 minutes. But the cool thing that will happen is after the first five minutes, all the familiar vocabulary will be exhausted. So the musicians are forced to make themselves become creative to get through the remaining 10 minutes. So a train wreck, you have to keep your ego out of the way. You really don't want to force anything to happen. Keep it simple, play to your strengths, remember to listen, and remember to catch others when they fall. So how do you recover from a train wreck? Remain calm, listen very intently, be aware of the parameters that are within your control, and then jump back in while playing very soft, very slow, and very simple. Always remember to relax. It's just going to work best that way. Always keep an open mind. Remember that the possibilities to create amazing music are endless and infinite. And there really is no right or wrong here. Uh, it's just art and it's your collective creation. It's there for you to just enjoy it as a group. Uh, realize that you bring something unique to the collective and that skill level ultimately is irrelevant. And just as with everything else, you gotta remember practice makes perfect.